Um, so our next paper is by uh, Peter Windsor from Australia, who's going to talk about a parasite which we don't see so much of in Europe, but there are increasing reports of it occurring, uh, Toxocara vitulorum, uh, and its control with fenbendazole blocks. Peter. Well, thank you. And good morning. I'm going to change the uh, uh, focus of this talk a little bit. Uh, tropical agriculture, uh, developing countries, and uh, the hopefully get this thing to work. Uh, that's the point. Yeah, good. Um, I'm from the University of Sydney, and uh, we are funded by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs through the uh, Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research to do uh, collaborative work to try and help scientists in developing countries in our region, particularly uh, Cambodia and Laos, where we've been working the last two years, war-torn countries with undeveloped veterinary services, and the, the important uh, need to try and give them some uh, scientific um, expertise particularly in agriculture, which is the majority of their uh, economies. Uh, in this particular trial, we did some private-public partnership work with uh, uh, colleagues of mine in a, a company that provides um, uh, nutrient blocks for the agriculture systems in Australia, particularly for uh, tropical cattle. And they, when I mentioned to them that I needed another way of delivering antiminics into this system, we came up with this idea. And, um, so what, what we have here uh, uh, in Laos, particularly in northern Laos, the, the, these buffalo are very valuable because the Vietnamese love to take them across the border and, and uh, eat them. And, um, uh, and they have no longer used them really for draft. Uh, these are the local cattle in, um, in Laos and they're little tropical things, uh, only weigh about 200, 250 kilos at maturity. Uh, but that's actually their storage of wealth. They don't have bank accounts. They try and keep uh, animals. As you can see, they have quite a number. It's not uncommon for a farmer to have 10 or 15, maybe even 20 of these animals. And they tend to house them overnight um, in an animal house, which becomes quite uh, contaminated with faeces, which may explain why toxic car is a bit of a problem. Um, they send them out grazing into the forests during the day. And one of the reasons why they like what we came up with is the animals come run, running home at night to eat a bit of this uh, molasses urea blocks that we, we introduced to the system. So I'm going to hopefully get it to work. Now, this is part of the big problem that we are facing with food security. Uh, I actually would have liked a whole big session on food security here rather than, say, complementary medicine. But anyway, I, I didn't come up with that idea uh, successfully. Um, you know, 60% more food by... by uh, by uh, 2050 or um, for the 9.7 billion people and about 97% of, uh, of farmers actually in developing countries, 1.3 billion of them, most of them don't have access to veterinary services or very poor uh, veterinary services. And you can see that the, um, the uh, high problems of food security in a country like Laos, war-torn country where they had suffered what they call the American War and, uh, and we work in areas where there's bomb craters and unexploded ordnance are still existing. And uh, the children are very malnourished, about 40, 50% uh, under, have malnutrition, undernourishment, uh, stunting, they call it. However, there's a huge change in this area, and these animals here, some of our animals being fattened, these are animals going up the river, up the Mekong into China, there's about a million of them went uh, a year or so ago. Australia's uh, exported um, basically 300,000 tropical cattle into Vietnam over the last three years each year. So it's massive expansion of demand for meat uh, in China and um, across Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is part of that process. Even though the Chinese uh, leadership has recently sa said, uh, no, we, we have to try and limit the amount of meat people consuming, the rapid uh, development of middle incomes is, is driving all this. Now, um, there's very good um, high-level expert book came out recently about sustainable agriculture and they spent a lot of time talking about how do we harness developing country agriculture to be part of the solutions for food security. And one of the issues they raise is, this pro is a problem of calf mortality. This is the graph of ha ha calf mortality across the world. You can see this is a, where it's over 20% 20, 20 and you can see it's very 
dominated by developing countries. It's a bit like foot and mouth disease. Foot and mouth disease occurs across here. It's a failure of food security. So is calf mortality when you get it over 25%. When I first went to Laos, they, and I started asking about what the problems were, they said, oh, 50% of all calves die. And I went, really? What from? Oh, Toxicara vitrilorum. Really? Oh, I can't be, can't, that can't be true. But 10 years later, I'm pretty much convinced that is true. Um, so we're working up here in a beautiful place called Luang Prabang, uh, and across here in Zengkwang. And the Ho Chi Minh Trail went through here during the American Vietnam War. And, uh, and so um, we're trying to repair some of that damage with these farmers. Um, 80, about 90% of, of the people in this area are livestock keepers. Can we turn them into livestock producers? And that's our challenge. And one of, the things, one of the things that's motivated me for years is we can use knowledge to change attitudes and improve practices. This is uh, really important. But to get that to really work, it's great if you can empower people with some kind of physical intervention, whether it's a drench that works or a vaccine or something like that. And people, knowledge is very useful if it's knowledge accompanied by a, uh, an applied intervention. And that's what we do a lot of social economics, social economic studies in this area. So, um, Toxicara vitrilorum is, so we did a big survey about the prevalence of this and, uh, um, oh, here we go. And so uh, we came up with a very high prevalence across and within uh, herds. Um, it's a simple parasite, it's transmitted by lactogenic roots. So the cows lactate and, and infect the calves and it's well known that if you treat a calf between 14 and 21 days with something like piperazine or pyrantal, simple tablet treatment, you could uh, solve the problem, the animals will get over it. The ill thrift weight loss stunting that they would normally have. Um, we found farms where there was up to 90% mortality. It may be other things going on there, but we couldn't establish anything other than Trixocara as the main cause of these mortalities. So, we encouraged everybody to treat with pyrantal. We made it available to farmers, we treated, we made it available to livestock extension officers and said, there you go. Just manage this problem. But it didn't sustain. Once that particular project stopped, they stopped treating. And we couldn't work out why. So we did some studies on that and published that paper. Why is a simple control option not being implemented unless you do it for them? And uh, those of you who haven't seen the worm, this is, this is what it does. It's just an ascrid. And so we, we tried to manage a way of looking at how we could improve the extension there. And, and the, I think the fact is that the, People are, very, are not very accomplished at managing animals. There are no facilities, there's no calf yards, and most farmers don't have any facilities whatsoever. So we, um, we think it comes down to really poor husbandry. Is it, is that, how do you change that? It's culturally, these animals are not ever really touched other than uh, you know, pushed into yards and things. So um, houses, animal houses. So. So we thought, well, let's try an alternative. And we knew that um, from previous work, some work done in Australia on uh, radio labelling fenbendazole, that it actually can be delivered through urea molasses blocks to sheep. Uh, it's never been commercialised, but it, we thought, well, let's try it. So we evaluated medicated blocks with fenbendazole and, your, and unmedicated blocks in a, in a pilot trial last year. And we wanted to estimate the production benefits also, and uh, because we knew we had a big problem but at, uh, between the end of the wet season in about December, January, and through to May next year when the pasture declines, the animals lose weight, as typical. You know. So we thought, here's a way of stimulating better use of low quality pastures by provi provision of urea in, ma in uh, molasses blocks. So the company was happy to donate large numbers of these blocks, which were sent up, and you can see the tropical heat causes a little bit of molasses to leak into the cardboard, but that's no problem. The animals will eat that quite happily. And uh, so we went on and 
We, we provided them at uh, five grams per kilo, these blocks, and uh, which should be able to deliver, you know, 0.5 milligrams per kilo of body weight, while else, else the, while ever the animals are consuming a reasonable amount of the block. We thought this is an opportunity to address some, some of the concerns about, in our part of the world, antimitic resistance is a, is a major problem, uh, not here, but in Australia. And the concept of correct dosing and all those things have been tried for years and hasn't slowed the problem down. So we're coming around to the idea that why don't we just use para these antimitics to suppress parasites, allow plenty of parasites in refugia to allow immunity, but parasite suppression. So it's a different way of approaching traditional parasitology. It's certainly something that I never would have advocated 10 years ago. So the idea you suppress parasites, allow animals to develop immunity, and address the dietary's concerns by improving ruminal utilisation or roughage is where we're coming from with this work. Um, so it's a, a parasite nutrition approach. So we did a pilot study last year with uh, 22 households and three villages, but we only had 66 cows in this pilot study. We wanted to see if, it, if we had safety, if we could actually do the work, etc. We only had uh, only just under 20 calves under four months, so it was a, it was a limited study across these villages and uh, these households and small numbers of calves. We collected uh, faecal samples, body condition scores, girth, coat texture, estimated values of animals before and after, and uh, did McMaster. Uh, fecal leaf flotations. We put a little bit of formalin in the, in the, with the uh, faecal samples so that they can be sent to the lab because there's quite a bit of transfer required, but it seems to work well. And um, so there you go, these are the faecal sampling. Animals are, are um, this is a bleeding pole. You put a pole against a tree. A big buffalo like that is a, is a challenge um, because um, if you don't get the right tree, They'll pull the tree up out of the ground, walk off with, it, with everything, but uh, and with your with your um, student or collaborator attached to the rectum. Anyway, it's a lot easier with these little fellows, but uh, uh, the local cattle, and we developed a weight tape from doing thousands and thousands of weights across our ways, uh, our weigh equipment, to get a light weight tape like that, and we did some quality control. Okay, um, those who haven't seen it, that was. There's the happy farmer. They loved them. They loved it because the the um, animals uh, because the animals love it, and they lick up the stuff and take it in. And we found very good results uh, of um, uh, reduction in both groups, both cohorts. 100% reduction in, uh, in the medicated blocks and 95% reduction in the unmedicated blocks, which was a nice surprise. So um, it looked like we were on a winner. And um, we had an increase in um, uh, challenging the animals that kept overnight pens with their strong vials. That was a bit of a surprise, but we think that might be just due to high levels of exposure. And we just saw some weight uh, improvements there too with the animals that are treated. So our pilot study concluded that we had decreased the, the egg counts with both treatment groups that we got a decrease in strong vials in seven days, and we had increased weight in both, uh, but particularly the medicated groups, uh, with limited numbers of animals, of course. What was very pleasing was how readily it was integrated, and the farmers loved it, the animals loved it, so we moved on from the pilot study because it, this we were quite excited. And we just completed a study this year, and the results just came out last week of the preliminary results. We haven't analysed them, but uh, we did a large study here, 114 um, groups with 87 cattle and 27 buffalo group calves, and um, we included a no-block control and an oral pyrantal treatment group. So we've got four cohorts there. The best practice with oral pyrantals and a no-block, no-treatment group, plus the medicated benzimidazole block and the unmedicated one. And the preliminary results suggest here that we got a, say, 50% reduction with the medicated blocks, only about 10% reduction with the unmedicated blocks. Surprisingly, um, 
80%, not 100% reduction with parental, which shows you that despite the fact that our, our extension people have been well trained in this, they still aren't able to deliver oral tablets effectively, presumably, unless there's been some high levels of contamination or something else going on which we're trying to work on. Of course, no reduction, increasing burdens in the control groups. So there we go. Um, there's our website. And as Winston Churchill said, success is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. I don't think we've got failure, but we know if we don't do something, there will be failure. There'll be a lot of, lots more calves dying. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Unfortunately, again, we're out of time for questions, so you'll have to grab them in the coffee break.